All right, we are about to begin a new portion of the course called F and W, or Fields and Waves. And as we do that, we're gonna take all that wonderful knowledge of transmission lines that we have spent several lectures building up uh, and all the applications to the power grid, to um, feeding signals across coaxial cables inside circuit boards, inside integrated circuits. And we're gonna set it aside just for a little while and place it inside a bucket. We're gonna come back to that bucket later. Um, but in order to dive deeper into the transmission line, uh, we have to look into what actually makes it work. And we have been talking about voltages and currents, but the reality is that voltages and currents are just manifestations of electromagnetic waves. That the transmission line is not so much a device that carries voltage and current, it's really a device that carries an electromagnetic wave. And so we wanna build up the tools to understand what an electromagnetic wave is. In doing so, we will, number one, uh, redefine how the transmission line works and come to be re-inspired about how it works. But then we'll also be able to blow the lid off this thing. And then once we complete that, we'll have an understanding of electromagnetic waves in general uh, and be able to apply it to radar propagation, um, to wireless communications, uh, to all kinds of sensors and systems that use electromagnetic waves and antennas uh, and a whole world of applications. But in order to get there, we've got to start off and build a little bit of mathematical tools that we're going to need. And in this lecture, this will be a few short lectures. Um, the first one will be covering vector algebra. All right, so uh, to this point, we have been considering uh, almost entirely things that are scalars, right? So scalars are uh, single quantities that describe how big or small something is only. Uh, examples of scalars are temperature, right? There's just, there's an amount of heat, but there's no direction associated with the heat. Uh, altitude, which is a scalar, brightness, how bright is a screen or a TV or anything. Um, voltage is a scalar. There's no direction associated with voltage. There's just um, an amount of voltage and same for current. Right, current's a little tricky because there kind of is a direction associated with whether it's a positive or a negative current, but that's not quite um, what we're talking about, right? Everything was restricted along a one dimensional line. So we didn't really have to specify the direction beyond just having a plus or a minus sign. Um, another example is cost, right? That's also a scalar that doesn't have a direction associated with it. Uh, we're gonna begin dealing with things called vectors and vectors, basically is a scalar plus a direction. Uh, an example is wind. If I tell you that the wind right now is 10 miles per hour, I haven't really specified the wind. I've told you something about it, but I have to tell you it's 10 miles per hour from the Northwest. And then you understand what wind means. Um, velocity also is a combination of a speed plus a direction. Uh, force, is an example of a vector. There's an intensity that I'm pushing with the force, but there's also a direction that that force is pushing. Uh, and more importantly, we're going to be covering electric field and magnetic field. Uh, and that's what we're gonna to get to in the upcoming lectures. Now there's lots of different ways that vectors can be denoted. Uh, and perhaps you have seen something like this where you have um, X, Y, and Z. And these are just the three coordinates of some three-dimensional vector that points in some direction. Uh, I'm going to advise not using that in this course. Uh, the math will be a little bit easier if we stick with a um, coordinate system that looks something like this. So instead of x, y, z, let's just put numbers to this, um, 5, 3, and 12. What we're going to do instead is define it like this. We're going to have 5 times this vector x hat plus three times this vector y hat plus 12 times this vector z hat. Uh, this x hat here is a vector with length one. That's what the hat means, it means length one. And it's pointed in the direction of the x axis. All right, so five times x hat is therefore a vector that is five times longer. So it has a length five and is pointed in the x direction. 
we're adding to that a vector that is pointed in the y direction that has length three, and to that a vector that has length 12 that's pointed in the z direction. So the coordinates are in here, but we're really decomposing a vector into three different sub vectors, which add up to form the total vector. All right, so this will be an easier way uh, to maintain things as we kind of go through some of the vector math. So I, I encourage this notation. Uh, the way we are going to denote a vector is with a letter, and we're gonna put a bar on top of that letter to indicate that it is a vector. When you see the bar on top, that means vector, at least in this course. All right, now, uh, there are a few different um, uh, additional notation that we might use. Sometimes we are going to specifically refer to the length of the vector or just sort of the scalar part of the vector and not the direction. Uh, and the way we're gonna do that is with uh, two bars or an absolute value sign around A. This is going to refer to the length of A. It's also sometimes called the norm or it's the intensity or it's the amplitude. Those are essentially all the same thing um, in this context, right? It's how long is that vector, but you've thrown away the information um, about where it's pointed. So this basically gives you a scalar when you put the um, absolute value sign around the vector, okay? Um, the other thing is if we just wanna isolate the direction of a vector is we can put an A right here and we'll put a hat over the top of it, All right? And so A hat uh, was going to be, um, by definition, we'll have length one and it's pointed in the direction of A. So this basically only isolates the direction of A, but throws away the information about how long A is. All right, we can relate these to each other in the following way. We can say that uh, A hat equals the vector A divided by the length of A. All right, so um, that's the way these three are related to each other. All right. Now for um, typical vectors in a sort of regular coordinate system, uh, the length of A can be written as the square of the sum of the three components. So uh, sometimes we're gonna wanna define these coordinates separately, five, three, and 12, and we're gonna use the notation A sub X will be the X coordinate of the vector A. All right, if we do that, then the length of A or the intensity of A can be written as the square root of A sub X squared plus A sub Y squared plus A sub Z squared. Now vectors, there, there will be a lot of multiplication and division that we can do with vectors. And so let's start with, um, with multiplying a vector by a scalar. So let's say C is a scalar. If we multiply C times the vector A, this just implies that we scale each component by C. All right, so um, the X component of CA multiplied by C and the same for the Y and the Z. All right, so um, we can multiply a scalar by a vector and it's relatively simple. We're just gonna multiply um, each one. We can also add up these vectors um, with each other. So A plus B will equal to AX plus BX. Just add up the X components and that will be the X component of the new vector plus a y plus b y in the y direction plus a z plus b z in the z direction. All right, so adding up uh, two vectors together, again, relatively simple. Uh, but there's gonna be a couple of different ways that we'll define multiplying vectors together. And the first one is a dot product, right? So 
dot product is a, and we're gonna put a dot right here with another vector b. Uh, and this is gonna be equal to a scalar c. All right, um, now you've probably seen this defined in the, in the following way. It's the absolute value of a times the absolute value of b times the cosine of theta. You've probably seen this before, equals a dot b. Um, I would encourage you to mostly not use this. There'll be a couple cases when this is useful, um, but I recommend not using that. Instead, what you wanna do is you wanna take the x, y, and z components of each vectors and multiply them together and then add them. So it's gonna look like this, a dot b equals ax times bx plus ay times by plus az times bz. This is a, a more compact way, particularly if you're keeping track of uh, vectors in terms of their coordinates, uh, then you don't have to figure out what data is, right? If, if, if you use this formula, a, b times cosine data, you gotta somehow figure out what data is first and then you can do the multiplication. And that's potentially very annoying. Um, if you've got the, the vectors right here, you know what ax, bx, ay, by, az, and bz are, then calculating this is very easy and very straightforward. And once you know this, by the way, you can, you can also figure out what the angle is between two vectors. So actually, um, uh, if you know what a times b is and you figure out what the simple matter, then we know that a dot b equals absolute value of a absolute value of b times cosine theta, you can rearrange that and find that theta equals the arc cosine of the dot product divided by the absolute value of A times the absolute value of B. Uh, so oftentimes it's easier to find the dot product first and then figure out what is the angle between two vectors. And that does uh, sometimes come in useful. All right. So that's dot product. That is one way to multiply two vectors together. And the result is a scalar. Right? The other way to multiply uh, two vectors together is with a cross product. All right, a cross product is denoted as a cross B with a little X in between, but it's not really a straight multiplication. Uh, what we're gonna do is, if you remember the three-dimensional determinant from earlier classes, uh, that is sort of the easiest way in my mind to remember what the cross product is. So the first row of the determinant will be X, Y, and Z, the unit vectors in each of those three directions. The second row will be the three components of the first vector A. So this will be AX, AY, and AZ. And then the third row, Close, close that determinant. The third row will be the same except for vector B, BX, BY, and BC. All right, if you uh, go back to the definition of determinant from your earlier math classes, um, it works out to be the following. You can just as easily memorize this if you want, but I tend to just write down the determinant. Uh, so this equals X hat times AY, BZ minus BY, AZ plus in the y direction, ax bz minus ax, oops, az, I got that backwards, hang on. az bx minus ax bz, and finally plus z direction, AX BY minus AY BZ. All right. And each of these components, let's say that uh, um, A cross B equals C, right? There's a new vector C that equals this cross product. Um, this uh, term right here is basically going to be equal to the X component of C. And this component right here it's going to be the Z component of C. I know one thing that uh, 
I'm going to point out right here is that a cross product, the order does matter. So A cross B is going to be the negative of B cross A. So for a cross product, the order matters. For a dot product, it does not. Right? A dot B equals B dot A. All right, so be sure you keep track of the cross product. Uh, now what the cross product means physically is basically a, a vector that's going to be perpendicular to both A and B. All right, so um, uh, by definition, C is perpendicular to A and C is perpendicular to B. That's just part of the definition of the cross product is number one. Um, and the length of C is, uh, you may have seen this before, it's the length of A times the length of B times the sine of the angle between them. All right, so uh, what a cross product does is it basically picks out to what degree the two vectors are perpendicular to each other, All right? So um, the absolute value of A cross B is connected to the orthogonality of A and B. What that means is that if A and B are already perpendicular to each other, then you're maximizing the length of the cross product. Whereas if A and B are parallel, right? if A is parallel to B, and that implies that the cross product is zero. Right? The opposite will be true for the dot product. A dot B is connected to the parallelness of A and B. So if A is perpendicular to B, then that implies that A dot B equals zero. All right, so dot product and cross product are kind of nice complements of each other in the sense that one picks out the amount that they are parallel to each other and the other picks out the amount that they are perpendicular to each other. One is a scalar and one is a vector. Now the direction of A cross B, you can determine with what's called the right-hand rule. Uh, there are two ways to do the right-hand rule. The first is to curl your right hand so as to sweep A into B. And if you do that, look at where your thumb is pointing and that's gonna be the direction of A cross B. Um, be sure you do it with your right hand. If you do it with your left hand, you'll get the negative answer, um, but that's one way to do it. The other way to do this is to spread your first three fingers, your, your thumb, your uh, pointer finger, and your middle finger. And if you do that, um, if you point your thumb toward A and your pointer finger toward B, then C will point in the direction of the cross product. So A cross B equals C with your first three fingers. Um, you can apply either one of those um, if you ever want to figure out what, which direction is which. Um, and either of those is a valid way to do the right-handed rule. All right. Uh, so that basically concludes um, this discussion of vector math. We're going to move on in the next video and build up our tools around uh, coordinate systems.